forward to her and looking forward to your keynote and um, everything that you have to share with us, Renee. Welcome. I'll leave the slide up to just for a second. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Uh, so it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of uh, what seems to be a very exciting initiative. Uh, I was asked to speak on achieving effective AI governance with inclusivity. And inclusivity is the practice or policy of providing equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized, such as those having physical, uh, mental, developmental uh, disabilities or belonging to a minoritized group. So inclusivity is critical to my work, which is at the intersection of AI ethics, data activism and public interest technology. I'm an AI ethicist, a data activist, a criminologist, criminal psychologist and a therapeutic jurisprudence specialist. At present, I am a community scholar at Columbia University and the first data activist in residence at the School of Data Science at the University of Virginia. I'm also the co-director of the University of Virginia's Public Interest Technology University Network. So in everything I do, I seek to bring an ethical approach to the application of algorithms everywhere they are deployed. I advocate for a justice-oriented and a trauma-oriented AI design and ethical algorithmic solutions built on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which are crucial to stretching the imagination of AI. My work in the public interest technology space examines the many levels and deep layers of bias and discrimination, exclusion, marginalization, profiling, victimization, and other inequities in data algorithmic decision-making systems, AI, and of course, new and emerging technologies in general. AI ethics is critical to ensuring human rights and civil rights and civil liberties are protected and remain protected, ensuring that unchecked algorithms do not ever infringe upon or erode our democratic rights. I also have a background in terrorism studies and counterterrorism, which have contributed significantly to my experience in AI risk management and AI crisis management and AI crisis communication and working with business leaders to help them communicate ethically about AI risks and building public confidence and public trust in AI. From the C-suite to Main Street, I examine challenges such as detecting, mitigating, and managing risks across the AI lifecycle, debiasing from design to deployment, monitoring and evaluating AI systems, and bringing critical and creative thinking to the ways in which we think about risks and do vulnerability audits and algorithmic impact assessment. So AI has the ability to, which we already know, create extraordinary possibilities in every possible sector and the potential to enhance everything we do. But we must get AI right. We must ensure AI is ethical, responsible, and trustworthy. AI is a powerful technology with such extraordinary promise to improve every aspect of our lives at scale and at speed. But we cannot continue to deploy AI without fully understanding and addressing its fundamental challenges and deficiencies. I'm always thinking of AI governance and inclusivity which is critical to governance and critical to building this robust and rigorous guardrail that we uh, speak about incessantly, particularly when examining challenges such as fairness and accountability and transparency and explainability, auditability, interoperability, black box opacity, and how the lack of an inclusive approach build on what we call the Jedi principle, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion could undermine public trust and public confidence in AI. So when we think of AI risks, the most critical categories of ethical risks that we focus on are privacy, accountability, transparency, explainability, fairness, and non-discrimination, security, and safety. 
And these ethical risks, if undetected across the AI life cycle from design to development, often spiral into crises that can create significant challenges to an organization. Reputational damage, nobody wants that. Revenue lost, regulatory backlash, criminal investigation, of course, diminished public trust and public confidence. And what about a media attack or a, a media expose? So inclusivity is critical in establishing a culture of risk within organizations throughout the design, development, and deployment process. It is crucial to establishing also a culture of critical thinking and critical design and intellectual confrontation that's open to ideals such as justice and diversity and equity. Inclusive innovation is an ethical organizational culture that is bold enough to implement solutions that we can count on, solutions defined as responsible AI or trustworthy AI or, or principled AI. And we've got to think about this within the context of PwC, of course, estimating AI can contribute up to 15.7 trillion to the global economy by 2030. Trillion dollar decision making that is revolutionizing every discipline, industry, and methodology. So effective AI governance means that companies must demonstrate that they are responsible, accountable, transparent, trustworthy, and operate with integrity. And AI is still relatively new. So many companies and businesses and business leaders are still learning how to navigate the responsible AI space. And many companies are learning from the mistakes of their predecessors and now embracing our responsible AI to guide design development and of course, to promote effective AI governance. And here's something to think about. And these are all situations where inclusivity was not a priority. An autonomous car kills a pedestrian because its image recognition feature is unable to recognize dark skin. An algorithm goes rogue or criminal. Facial recognition creates wrongful arrest. Bias AI and bias decision-making discriminates against black indigenous people of color. How about death using a GPS that sends you off a cliff? Physical harm from a robot that crashes into you while you're working in a warehouse your personal data compromise, anonymization didn't work and you've been identified. Discrimination through digital redlining where people of color, black and brown, indigenous people of color relegated to certain neighborhoods. How about loans denied, mortgages denied or systemic racism in sentencing black and brown defendants disproportionately getting longer sentences based on algorithmic decision-making systems that discriminate. So, Inclusivity not only reduces risks, but protects rights because inclusivity is about organizational maturity, which speaks to effective AI governance. Within the context of organizational maturity, inclusivity sends a very clear message of preparedness and readiness and the ability to respond in real time to risks and other challenges, as well as your respect for rights. An inclusive approach means that you have explored operational impacts and examined financial impacts using diverse perspectives and divergent thinking. A lack of an inclusive approach could mean regulatory fines, contractual penalties, consumer dissatisfaction and consumer defection. So effective AI governance through inclusivity is a commitment to representation, accessibility, visibility, voice. Inclusivity speaks to diverse stakeholder engagement and interdisciplinary collaborations. It, it offers a reimagining of, of knowledge and what we define as, as expert. It also establishes a risk culture of critical thinking and, and critical design. And it, it builds public trust and, and public confidence, which directly impact a brand from development to sustainability. So diverse stakeholders underscore an inclusive approach. It's a broad-based representation of diverse voices and diverse 
diverse experiences, perspectives, ideas, faces, visibility represent broad-based public stakeholder engagement and long-term stakeholder engagement that really looks at those long-term impacts of data and society and technology and AI on society. So inclusivity demonstrates critical thinking and evaluation have been applied to the process. And it, it really speaks to the fact that without it, you risk excluding individuals and communities and groups and further alienating or marginalizing. So when we think effective AI governance, uh, inclusivity speaks to due diligence, duty of care, due process. It reduces bias and discrimination and of course, enhancing uh, fairness. It's also about accountability and transparency and explainability in real time and about social responsibility, organizational sustainability. So if we speak effective AI governance, we are speaking about those robust ethical guardrails that inclusivity helps us shape. We are speaking about protecting our many stakeholders and constituencies and, and public. And we're speaking about AI integrity AI legitimacy and AI maturity. So within the context of do no harm, within the context of an ethical approach to AI, inclusivity says very simply, we care, we are responsible, we are prepared to do what is right. We have embraced an ethics of care. We do not have to wait on the law that always lags behind innovation to do the right thing. Effective AI governance is about trust. And without inclusivity, there is no trust. Trust is everything. Without trust, there is nothing. The lack of trust shakes the foundation and many other aspects of business begin to fall apart. You cannot buy trust back. I think we all know that. And building trust back is a very slow process. So inclusivity protects your business, your business model. It provides uh, that avenue to contingency planning. It protects your customers, your users, your, your stakeholders. It protects the organization. So a real-time approach to effective AI governance through inclusivity would be proactive, of course, never reactive. It would include uh, real-time consultation and collaborations, uh, cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, and of course, being culturally responsive. And of course, including the JEDI principle, justice, equity, diversity and inclusion, and embracing as a business model, not only a risk-based approach to AI ethics, but a, a rights-based approach to AI ethics. And it's about representation. I cannot say this enough. Visibility, voice, accessibility. These are the things that have stretched the imagination of AI and bring integrity to the algorithmic decision-making process and, and to bring a particular kind of maturity to the ways in which we are designing, developing, and deploying AI. Uh, inclusivity as part of an effective AI governance strategy, of course, is about civil rights and and civil liberties. It's about agency and, and empowerment for your stakeholders and the communities you serve. And in there, it's about compassion and empathy because what is critical about AI and something that I always say is that we don't ever want to get up to a point where we've got to create an algorithm to teach us how to be human again. It's about inclusive innovation. It's about those ethical and robust uh, frameworks that are critical, and it's about ethical stewardship for the organization. So using inclusivity is a great way to reimagine AI and rethink effective AI governance and to embrace new respect for justice and equity and diversity and inclusion, and to make these ideals a part of your business model. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Renee. Um, thank you. Thank you for hitting on all the points that we have been talking about through the conference and through diff different dialogues that 
we may be privy to, so everybody may not be privy to or may be privy to, but these are really uh, lofty goals to have. And we are looking to see how we can make it happen in this conference. So as you know, the IIA, between IIA and the governance um, uh, organizations such as ISACA and IIA and ISC squared, there is a lot of the, uh, you get the years of the, um, or year of management, right? You, between the chief risk officers and the um, audit committees, and now even the security function. So thank you for hitting on all the notes that I think are really important for us as we prepare these messages for management. And thank you for, for giving your intro because I didn't want to leave out anything that was important uh, to mention. So I appreciate it. You have so many things in your bio. Thanks for the opportunity. It's always good to engage with, with colleagues and to, you know, in whatever we do, just really stretch that ethical and creative imagination of, of new and emerging uh, technologies that brings the, the kind of respect and representation that speaks to a mature technology, that speaks to a technology with integrity, and of course, that speaks to a technology that we want to, to trust. So thank you very much and best of luck with the rest of your uh, event. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, now we come to the um, part of the uh, um, presentation, Bill had to drop. So I'm going to see if I am um, able to do the, both the um, hosting and the uh, presenting. So thank you. And let me know if you can see my screen. Um, I am, it's, it is showing I'm screen in sharing, so I'm going to take that leap of faith. Um, so as we come to the last session, the last keynote, um, this was actually a full-blown one-hour presentation, but I was going to do it in half an hour and now in 15 minutes because I wanted to be cognizant of all the other requests for speakers, um, including Lucas uh, had made the request to um, present on a very important topic for um, third-party risk assessment. So I'm going to go through some of the highlights of what are the algorithmic damages that we are already seeing out there. Hence, the, uh, we're in a strange situation, right? This is not a, um, these are not high, highly understood systems. AI systems are not highly understood. There is a lot of complexity. We are rolling them out. We want to have the right outcomes. And yet we haven't told anyone what these, how to inculcate or how to incorporate those outcomes. So yes, we do want transparency. We want accountability. We want security. We want privacy. Uh, how? How is this going to be, how are we going to change and change the rules mid-flight, right? It's not an easy task. And what you see on the screen are some of the ones, it doesn't matter if you're not seeing, uh, it doesn't mean to, I don't mean to um, only highlight these, but if there is one takeaway from the screen, it is there are high impact, systems that we are already using and deploying and we are seeing the fallouts. And that is the bigger message than which companies you see over here, okay? Or what news articles. Given a day that you're creating the slides, you're gonna have a different um, smorgasbord of these um, images. So what, um, let me continue with the, uh, like, like I said, I have to figure out how to go. Okay, there we go. Do we need trust? W trust in what? There are systems, AI systems we're seeing everywhere. So where do we even start? And if we don't take a proactive and a very well-defined approach and a process and a technology um, uh, integration, give the right tools out in terms of this guidance, this is going to be a pipe dream. 
we have seen this already as security professionals, um, when, especially when you go to the business community and management and you try to uh, uh, ask them for a security budget, for example, there is no, um, if you don't see security lapses, they don't exist. If you don't security controls effectiveness, they don't exist. So how are you going to get a budget to do this right when you cannot even do it for a, uh, when we cannot do it for even cybersecurity, which is an immensely complex issue uh, and a complex area. We can't do that uh, effectively and we know there's no 100% security. And yet we're building systems where we don't know what these systems are, uh, how we're incorporating um, messages we've already learned or lessons we've already learned. So why am I saying trust? Trust in what? And why trust, right? And how do we get there? Let me get to that. Dialogues that lead to action. That's what we are doing here today and what I hope we have more of and that we are privy to what those are. There may be a lot of, lot of dialogues happening, but very um, similar to security policies that you may have the best and the most robust policies. If they are sitting on a bookshelf gathering dust, it is not gonna help us. And these are actions that we need now. The other ask, uh, question I asked was, is security trust? Or why are we talking about trust when this is a, uh, and we're talking about, um, I, and yet I'm talking about cybersecurity. So cybersecurity, a holistic approach to cybersecurity does include a management approach, a, a management policy, a implementation, and then we have the technical part of our security, right? So there are a lot of areas over there to bring into a development or rolling out of technology or anything for that matter. But when it comes to AI, I challenge that security is definitely not enough when we are building these systems. So given that, what do we need? Um, Dr. Um, McKnight or Professor and Dr. McKnight had talked about what are um, you know, smart cities and what are the conversations that we need to have around smart cities for security. But when we are talking about AI, security is a part of those, uh, the security holistic approach of security does not just remain in the hands of cybersecurity. And what we need for having done years of years, 25 years of creating a strategic approach to cybersecurity, I will bank my last dollar on this, which is when we are talking about security for AI, we need a model that includes something that developed called TIPS, transparency, integrity, privacy, and security. In fact, I gave a talk on a workshop on Bright Talk on what are the essential pillars of cybersecurity for AI. And that is not just security. So just bear with me when I explain that. When we're talking about a secure system, a secure artificial intelligence system with high complexity, lot of different ways that it learns from conventional software. So for example, in conventional systems, we are using if then, then else logic, right? If this happens, then this is, the, uh, this is the outcome. However, in AI, there are so many differences from a normal, uh, a typical development cycle that these to in, even in, integrate security and a DevSecOps model or even an ML ops model is not enough to have a siloed approach. We really need to look at it holistically and we can do this. We looked at the, um, the governance framework that WEF had presented. Um, there are certainly other frameworks, but we need to have the, the audience and the, the groups involved in this conference, security, audit, and governance. We have to come together and we can do this if we have a holistic understanding of the risks, right? You cannot just look at it through a security lens or a privacy lens or a governance lens. 
what do we need? We are looking at systems that we want success. We want them in our lives because I will give you one example of, actually maybe two, let me um, go to the example on something that law enforcement, which um, I think speaks to everyone. And we, we started out with um, a law enforcement um, kind of a use case and a keynote. So for that purpose, I'm gonna just focus on facial recognition, which is AI technology, which is being used for AI uh, systems. And we are using that not in a very, uh, I would say low impact way. So it kind of highlights the impact of these systems. And again, going back to algorithmic damages that we are seeing out there, this is a good example. Um, so what, what is the, let me tell you about, if anybody recognizes any of these um, uh, faces on the screen, please let me know. But I will read this um, news article and it is February, 2019. Najib Parks was accused of shoplifting candy and trying to hit a police officer with a car at a Hampton Inn in New Jersey. They identified him using facial recognition software, even though he was 30 miles away at the time of the incident. So now it just keeps getting worse. He went to, he went to jail and uh, the, he paid a bail for $5,000. And it was later dismissed for lack of evidence. He is suing the police and uh, et cetera. Now I won't go into too many details on that, but he is the third person to be falsely arrested based on a bad facial recognition match. And they were all, um, they all happened to be black. Facial recognition technology is not a, is not known, is not, has not been vetted out as a fully um, safe and secure uh, technology. So when we use, we, we take technology, which is not completely meshed out and all the kinks are ironed out and start applying them in high impact um, scenarios, whether it's for arrest or whether it's for hiring, whether it's for a credit card, that, that was some of the other examples you saw in my algorithmic um, um, fallouts that are happening or um, sorry, <laughs> algorithmic failure that we are seeing already. Then the problem becomes, how do we first be aware of that? And in this case, he was arrested. The only way he was able to get a redemption is because he recognized that he asked, how, why did you arrest me? And he was given the picture that was in the facial recognition software. And when he realized, and he told them, this is not me. And I was, and he, he was able to prove uh, that he was 30 miles away. The, he was um, let go. It could have been really bad outcomes for him because this was not his uh, first time. He had a minor infraction, I think before, but you can look into those do details later. The, the, the point I want to highlight is there was a lack of due process and there was a, a, a demonstrable lack of due process and also that the uh, software did not do the correct uh, recognition. So let me pause. Is the problem that we are using facial recognition software or is it that because it does not have the right guardrails built in when it was built, the software that was used. I am again going to challenge and say, no, we can use the software because we don't have any options. There are so many uh, perpetrators out there who are going to be using facial recognition software, for example, or trying to um, compromise these systems. So the answer is not that we don't use this. My favorite analogy is let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We do want the promise that AI holds. Question is, can we get there and how do we get there? We, if we recognize that these systems are good for aiding in decision-making and not making decisions, and we have the right process to go along with it, 
And we have the, uh, the holistic approach of not only looking at what the problem is, but what are the different solutions, uh, not just have a fixed mind on what a solution is. Then I would say that, yes, we can see the promise that we do need and that we are hoping from uh, to get out of, um, let me stop sharing, that's a different, uh, um, <laughs> I see Lee, uh, Professor McKnight has his uh, mask on. I was not looking at the screen earlier. So um, what, I'm, what I would like to say is at the end of the um, first day, we are going to need artificial intelligence to help us and get to the outcomes we want. We as a society have to be very clear on what are those outcomes that we do want. When we are talking about bias, when we're talking about um, bias as individuals, we, there's uh, Suzanne Araj, she's one of my instructors at um, Stanford University, continuing education and Sudha Jamte, as they mentioned very clearly, there are 360 biases that exist. There's a codex that exists. Do a Wikipedia search for bias. And we as humans are never not going to have a bias. And when we build these systems, we cannot not have that seep through. So the question is not, do we need bias or how do we um, um, mitigate it? And how do we recognize it? That's going to be one of the uh, holistic measures that I was talking about. When we're building these systems, this is not, security is not the only element we need when I'm talking about a secure AI system. A secure AI would be something that is a holistically, uh, includes elements of trust, and that trust would rely on, would be based on the factors I mentioned earlier. There is ample guidance out there, but we as professionals really have to band it together to see how we can make this happen. I do have a, a framework that I've published and I invite every, everyone who would like to join forces in making that a reality. It's a AI tips model, um, transparency, integrity, privacy, and security. And um, on that note, I think I'm just gonna pause and see if anybody has any questions. Let me see if there's something in chat as well. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to end there. I've been talking for a while and um, let me see, are you gonna stop recording?